All right, so the purpose of this meeting is that this is an information meeting, and we're going to share with you the 14 key strategies and the overview on the implementation of uh, plans to address the strategies. And this strategy runs from 2022 to 2024, which means in 2023, there needs to be another strategic planning team that looks at what our next steps are, what, what will we do in the future. So this doesn't end here. Um, this strategy was presented to Leadership Council, and they approved it, that we move forward and implement the plans. And they had some comments, like it's very ambitious, which it is, and that uh, very hopeful for our future at the church and exciting. So, and you'll see as we go through this that it is going to require a lot of uh, congregation support and engagement. It's only with your help that these great things are going to be possible. So the Strategic Planning Committee was formed back in 2020, just before COVID hit. And so we had a few interruptions along the way. And during that time, we've had several people serve on the committee, including John Hawthorne, Tom Green, Jan Hicks, Jason Kraft, Tanya, Ernison, Ethan Gregg, and Tori Munier, and me, I'm Candy Pulaski. We um, did lots of uh, information ways to gather information to put the, these findings together, including a congregation study, community study, we brought in a strat coach to help us, and then we've also researched other churches. So this information that you're seeing here is based on information that we've gathered from you and that we've uh, factored in what we have found at uh, that is work at other places. As I said, there are 14 strategies there are just over a hundred implementation strategies. So, great. So here's our agenda, and um, the, at the beginning, we're going to talk a little bit about what the process was to develop the strategies, and then we'll look at the key strategies and implementation. We'll also look at the enablers to support those. And then we'll, we'll talk about what's on the horizon. So, this is the process that we use. If you've been coming to these, you've seen this slide several times. The good news is that we have now moved to the strategy box. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and um, so, to get there, we, we've looked at values, vision, and mission. We've done a lot of uh, research, uh, including that congregation community research. And then we've also uh, had some engagement that's happened already, and then we've had volunteers help with interviews with the community. We've done a lot of town halls. We've had uh, presentations uh, to various groups like she leadership council. And Tom had a, had a uh, sermon series. So now we're ready to share this with more folks. And okay, so this is the mission, vision, and guiding principles, principles and the values on the right-hand side, the blue box, those will be developed, those are yet to be developed by the implementation teams. So this vision was developed by the uh, by a small group in October of 2019. I think several of you may have been involved in that. It was a, a workshop that happened at the church. And this is the, the vision that you see and you read all over the place that we uh, at First United Methodist Church is an inclusive, intergenerational faith community that loves God with our hearts, our hands, and our voices. And um, so when this was put together, this vision was put together, some of the goals were to include that it mobilizes the church 
and that moves us forward in a dynamic, to a dynamic future. Then on the missions, we have uh, the STRAC team worked on those, and I'm turning this off before it alarms me. And um, we put together this, and this has also been seen by the uh, Leadership Council. And we've defined the purpose to invite, to inspire, and to ignite. <coughs> invite people to become disciples of Christ, all people to worship and educate and fellowship, and then people to um, change lives through mission, service, and generosity. And these follow the United Methodist mission of making disciples for Jesus Christ and transforming me. Oh, must have been cut off. Life. The world. The world. Thank you. Uh, our guiding principles are that we love like Jesus, we learn his ways of mercy, mercy and forgiveness, and that uh, we lead by example. So, real quick, I'm, the next three slides are on some things that we learned when we did the congregation study. And I included these because it's quite interesting. You'll see that some of the joys and satisfactions that some people experience at church, other people don't have that same experience. So you'll see here that among our greatest joys are our music, fellowship, friendship, worship, uh, our welcoming environment, uh, spiritual growth, and that we in service to others. And then we can look at our greatest challenges, you'll see some of these same things again. Some people felt like we're not welcoming and that we lack our worship, lacks flexibility, that our music, more contemporary options, or our contemporary options, and that might be in how we present our music versus the music that we are, we are singing. And um, spiritual growth, there's limited opportunities for that, and lack of outreach. So I found it really interesting that some people felt joys and some people see these as, as um, challenges that need to be addressed. Okay. Yes? Are the numbers for instance, like 8, 14, or more, is that a percentage of all the people who have worked? I gotcha. That's a very good question, Tim. The numbers that are listed here are the number based on the numbers mm -hmm. of responses that we got that apply to this? Those are the people, not, not a percentage. Right. Um, Those are the people, not a percentage. So if you add them all up, you'll figure out we had a uh, a low response to the survey. I have no nice way of saying that. Uh, a low response to the survey, but we did gather information and we figured the people that responded had a passion and they wanted to make sure that we knew. So, and then on this last slide, we asked a question about what things would you like to add, change, enhance, or discontinue? So I know that's a wide range there, and you can't really tell if they're saying, you know, that we want to do community development and expand that, or if they want to drop, but based on you know, other feedback that we've gotten, you know, there, there's an interest in expanding some of these things or changing some of these things. So we will be looking at ways to trying to balance between making changes and, and um, continuing some of our, our traditions. And that will be, uh, it will be an interesting time for us. Sarah Benedetto, is going to come and talk a little bit about how she feels about change. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Candy. Good morning, everybody. Or good, is it noon? Good noon time, everybody. I'm Sarah Benedetto, and I'm going to share some thoughts with you today. Um, I'm quite passionate about this, and I hope that you will find that as you, as I share some of my thoughts, that um, that will come through. Um, I've attended this church since I was born. I've been a member of this church since my confirmation in middle school. 
My parents, um, Sandy and Carol Ricks, joined the church in the mid-1960s, and I was baptized in this church, as were each of my four children. As a child, I participated in Sunday school, the youth group. I think I was a member of Tim's first um, bell choir. I remember when the bells were purchased as a member of the youth bell choir. I sang in youth choirs. I attended countless potlucks and ran around this room, hiding behind the cupboard over there. Um, and I um, uh, attended mission trips and several Christian camps. Um, and then I grew up and I got married in this church. And I sang in adult choirs, and I participated on various committees, and still do. Um, I played on church volleyball teams and softball teams. I taught Sunday school. Um, and I've raised four children with love and support from the members of this congregation. So I have a history with this church. And I want to have a future with this church as well. And that's why I'm here talking with you today. <coughs> For those of you that know me well, I am quite uh, somewhat sentimental. I don't often embrace change, especially not just for the sake of embracing change, or for the sake of change. I am most comfortable in my skin when things are kind of stable, and I tend to be past focused, and I relish in memories of the past and what things used to be. Um, I miss the old days of our church. I miss the times when the youth group literally had 40 kids in the youth group. My husband does not believe me, but I know, because you were youth leader, Mom, you will vouch for that, right? Um, and there were several children's choirs and lots of Sunday school classes for kids and adults. I miss the large potlucks, and I miss two full services on Sunday mornings and a choir that spilled into the sides of the balcony. And I miss that standing room only on Christmas Eve service. If you didn't get here 30 minutes before the service to hear the music, you were either standing or sitting on a folding chair in the back of the church. I miss that time. Somewhere along the way, the way our world has changed. And I have watched things change right here in our church over the decades. With declining participation and fewer kids and younger families um, joining or attending the church. When my husband Bill and I got married in our 20s, we were part of the younger generation of this church. And at 54, I still feel like I'm part of the younger generation of this church. So, ouch. Societal changes have been a big part of this decline. It's not everything to do with just this church, right? Um, my generation is part of those things. We, we overschedule ourselves and our families. We move to, di to different churches because we want to have a new experience or some flashy new thing. Um, or we've left church altogether. And we as a congregation of Jackson First may not be able to prevent some of these things, and we're certainly not responsible for all those things that have happened. But we cannot sit still and do nothing and let it keep happening and keep declining. We have an opportunity, and in my opinion, an obligation to make sure that future generations can continue to worship at First United Methodist Church in Jackson and serve our community. We do so much for the community. If we don't embrace the future and try new things, change the way we look and feel, maybe, well, to put it bluntly, in my opinion, we, are, we don't have a very lengthy future. Um, and like many churches before us, we will eventually have to close our doors. It's very hard for me to say that. Um, I, for one, don't want to sit around and watch that happen. I think together we can do and be so much more. So I'm asking each of us, myself included, to set aside our fears and look courageously to the future. This does not mean that we give up everything that we give up our history and some of our great traditions, but rather that we embrace new opportunities to use our God-given talents, to be creative, to welcome new ideas, to reinvent ourselves, to welcome new people, develop new traditions, and help create a vital Jackson First for generations to come. So please, let us open our minds, our hearts, our voices and our hands to the future so we can continue to serve God, building disciples of Jesus Christ, supporting our community, and help change the world. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah, 
Eric does have a deep love for the church. Ooh. <laughs> of a fruitful congregation. Tanya is going to go over these in a little bit more detail, so I'm not going to read them all now. But again, the five practices of a fruitful congregation are uh, radical hospitality, passionate worship, intentional faith development, risk-taking mission and service, extravagant generation, and then there are a few enablers things that we have identified that will help support these, these strategies and um, help the way that we are getting things done in the church. So now Tanya's going to come and talk about the strategies. Um, yeah, we'll pass out a, a um, strategy at a glance so that you'll have that for reference. <laughs> This is what you've been waiting for. <laughs> I'm hearing time and time again, when are we going to hear what the strategies are? And we are pleased to share them with you. Radical hospitality, in terms of a review, has to do with intentional and consistent welcome to all people. Not just people who come through our doors, but teaching our congregation to be more welcoming in all of your network of friends so that you learn how to um, be a presence of Christian hospitality or the welcome of Christ wherever you are. Passionate worship, again, has to do with consistency and intentionality, um, connecting people with God and connecting people with one another. Uh, intentional faith development. Well, again, you're going to hear that word intentional. Going from where you are to becoming more like Christ. And that needs to be offered for every person in the church from cradle to grave because we never graduate from the school of Christ. And then there's risk-taking mission. It's not just writing a check, it's engaging with people, it's building relationships. And then extravagant generosity is not only extravagance with our finances, but with our time and our talent, and even the resources that we have available to us, like our building. Let's see how do I move this forward? Yep, there we go. So as we put together this recommendation, this list of strategies, we've identified the key issues for us, and then for each issue, we are recommending any number of um, goals or strategies that we're going to focus on in order to address the key issues before us. The first one is, we do not promote Jackson First United Methodist Church. One of the things that I heard out in the community this summer was folk didn't even know that we're still open. Um, and it seems that in many ways, Jackson First, our congregation, is kind of the best kept secret in our community. Um, we have begun this work with the hire of um, Tori Munier, our communications director, we're becoming much more intentional about uh, communicating not just with the people in our community, but also communicating within our congregation so that people know what's going on on a regular basis. If they have an idea or a concern, they know who to go to. 
And so we will, our strategy is to increase the ways in which people in the Jackson community hear about Jackson First United Methodist Church. And again, you're going to see a pattern with these strategies where in many cases we're going to be identifying task force or work teams to focus on some particular elements of fulfilling the strategies. Get ready, every one of you, most likely, is going to be tapped to participate in some one of the task forces that will be set up, and there will be probably dozens of them. We're going to develop a task force to evaluate all of our current communication channels, um, internal, meaning website and our uh, weekly newsletter, our Thursday uh, uh, announcement blast, our email, Facebook, um, and uh, cable broadcasts, etc. But we're also going to be looking at ways we communicate more effectively in the community so that folk know what's going on and know that we're here and that they are welcome to join us and to be a part of who we are. Out of this task force will come a communication plan. And again, in almost every case, there's an issue that we need to address, there's a strategy to address it, there's a task force identified to do the work around that strategy, and then a plan will be put into place. Because what we've discovered in all churches is that to do these five practices well needs consistency and intentionality. That comes out of developing a plan and then working the plan. So you're going to hear me say that over and over and over again. And then we will also develop communication processes if we have special communication or if there is some, uh, we've got a very diverse congregation, for instance. We've got a whole host of folk who worship online. We've got, um, on the other end of the spectrum, in terms of the technology spectrum, we've got folk who don't even own a computer. And our plan will have to include how do we stay in contact with um, the techies among us and the non-techies among us so that everyone feels like they have our stakeholders in the life of our congregation. There is limited guidance on inviting and welcoming visitors. If you haven't been watching my Monday and Thursday Food for Thought, I encourage you to do so because in those um, twice a week uh, promotions, I'm going to be sharing some more anecdotal um, examples of what some of these strategies might look like. We're going to develop a fit team, first impressions team, because I said uh, last week, you only get one shot at making a first impression. And so it's important that consistently we make a really good first impression so that as people encounter us, not just on Sunday morning, but at Fresh Food Initiative, at concerts, uh, weddings, funerals, etc., they have a good experience and want them to come back and uh, explore more. <clears throat> We're going to be looking at um, ways that we can connect people more intentionally and then follow up with visitors. We're doing a pretty good job in some elements of our welcoming right now. We've got a very uh, dedicated group of greeters and ushers who um, are really intentional about welcoming people, but we're not doing well at follow-up. And so if some, some folks sign the connection card, they may or may not ever hear from us. Um, so those are one of the pieces where, with intentionality, we'll be more likely to follow through with people. I'm going to move now to um, the next key issue, which is training in hospitality. And this isn't just about our welcoming behaviors at the door. It includes welcoming behaviors among all of us. I've walked into sanctuaries and sat down as a, a new person 
only to have somebody lean over and say, uh, excuse me, you're in my seat. <laughs> Not a very welcoming behavior, is it? Um, and so part of what we're going to do is introduce a culture of hospitality where every person who is part of this church family knows that it's not somebody else's job, but it's their job to make sure that people feel welcome. So that on Sunday morning, if a newcomer comes in, you're not making a beeline to talk to your friends, but you're making a beeline to talk to those persons that you don't know or don't know well yet to make sure that they feel welcome. That's going to be for clergy and for uh, laity. It will include how to invite people. One of the primary ways that a church grows is by invitation. And if members of the congregation who are excited about their church are willing to talk about what's happening here and invite others, we're much more likely to see that growth. I've heard people say, I'm much more able to um, recommend my favorite restaurant than I am my church family. And we've got some work to do when it comes to teaching welcoming behaviors. And then um, we also don't currently have a plan to actually support the needs of new people in our midst. Um, if someone comes in the door, and uh, oftentimes, if it's a first time or a first few times, that's a key to, or that's a cue for us that there's something happening in their lives. And believe me, a newcomer has very different needs than someone who grew up in this church who feels at home. And so we need to be sensitive to that and have a plan for finding out what needs are and then being very intentional about meeting those needs. Not to say we're going to play favorites, but we need some balance between having care, like through our congregational connectors with our existing church family, but then those persons who are new to us to be more intentional and effective in meeting their spiritual and relational needs. The next is a passionate worship. Passionate worship connects people with God and connects people with one another. And again, this was identified as one of the strengths of our congregation. However, there are times and ways that we're missing the mark. Um, and we can always do better. Um, in order to deepen the worship life of the traditional worship service, we will form a worship design team. Currently, Tim and Greg and I meet on a weekly basis, but we're going to expand that to include um, uh, additional um, voices and people um, who want to um, maybe have us look at different elements of ways that we can step up um, the excellence in our traditional worship. And um, then we have no plan currently for a non-traditional worship service. Um, organs and choirs don't float everybody to boat. And there is, a, and why it is very meaningful to me, and even to my children who grew up in a traditional church home, um, there is a whole population of unchurched people out there. I believe the current percentage is about 90%. Yeah. Oh, it's a really high percentage of unchurched people. As Paul said, the field is ripe to the harvest. And we have an opportunity um, to add an additional worship experience to meet the needs of our broader community. That will be one of these long range plans that will take some, uh, some time 
and some resources in order to invest in starting a non-traditional, we're not calling it, um, uh, we're not calling it uh, contemporary, we're not calling it, we're modern, we're just saying a non-traditional, which means we're going to give people um, out there a viable option for other worship experiences. And it may not be Sunday morning, um, it may be um, at an entirely different time during the week. Um, let's see. Those, those are the only two for passionate worship, because again, that was considered one of our strengths. Let's look next at intentional faith development, and Deacon Greg is going to share with you some thoughts about that. Thank you, Tanya. We look at uh, how we grow as disciples. We recognize that people do that in a variety of different ways. And we come to God and we, and we learn about our faith and we grow in our faith in many different fashions. And uh, it's, it's pretty clear to most churches, and including here, that um, it would help if we had a plan to help people know where they are, where they want to go, and how to get there. And so one of the key issues that came up is we don't have a plan currently for helping people develop in their faith. We have lots of activities and opportunities, but there's no overall um, guiding plan or document. So we want to address that. We want to create um, a clear path for helping people deepen their relationship with, with God. Um, in order to do that, we're going to need some teams, some task forces, to help us create a plan and then work on the different pieces of that plan to engage everyone as they move through life and as they move through faith. Um, so uh, in the description, we call those growth teams. And growth is an acronym for uh, a, a, a discipleship attitude about how we connect with God, and my, um, my hope is that the, this team will do those things as they learn and develop ways for us to, to uh, be more engaged in the, in the ways that we develop faith. And maybe, okay, so if you're wondering what these things are, so these are, the, these are those things about well, Bible study and prayer and um, being part of a small faith development group and um, connecting with others and, and helping celebrate gifts and talents. Um, how we have classes and small groups and all those things. So that's, what's, that's what we mean by, a, by what might be in a plan for discipleship. Another issue that we've, we've recognized and is very true that there are a few people who are attending any of our classes by and large. We have a couple uh, great courses that are being offered that have really good response and attendance. But by and large, there are not a lot of people who are choosing to attend Things. So we want to create a group that looks at that and looks at why those things are true and what can we be offering that helps each of those groups, um, more groups develop and help them um, get populated with people who want to do those kinds of things. So. And we're, we're quite aware, and it's a key issue for us, about the, the low number of of families and children ministries and programs, um, and that's a reflection of how many children are here. We noticed there weren't any in worship this morning. Um, that happens occasionally, from time to time. There's all kinds of reasons why there are children here on, on Sunday morning, and we're pretty sure that most of them are watching from home. Um, but uh, and we, we need to develop new ways to fix that in the ministry with our, with our online viewers as well. But. Uh, the strategy, so we have a strategy to address that, and um, would be to increase the numbers, and we have some, some ideas that maybe 30 by 2024 would be a, a goal to work toward. The handout you have um, says 50 children. You might see that further on in other um, documents too. The date for that's a little further up, down the road. So if you see the 50 number thing further down in the future, 25. yeah, 2025, and if you see the 30 number, we're talking more immediately. Um, so this is going to take some teams of people working hard together to make these things happen. Uh, again, these growth teams that will focus on children and youth, focus on young adult and family ministries, um, find ways to, uh, to help those folks engage with the church, engage with each other, find them, and then bring them in. So this is 
A lot of these strategies you will notice relate to each other. So the, the welcoming and inviting piece is part of how do you how do you minister to more people? Sometimes you have to go find them and invite them in, right? So um, the other part of this strategy is to uh, continue to grow ministries and opportunities for young adults and for families. Um, we're starting a few of those things now, but uh, that needs to be developed and expanded. And this may require more staff, more likely will be if we're going to do this well. So the, the, one of the task forces will evaluate the need for, for um, staff to just support this good work. The other thing that's a vital part of a church is um, how, we, how we serve the needs of others. So this idea of risk taking mission and service. How, how we use our resources to meet the needs of our community. And, um, and how we share Christ with them as well. And there are a number of things that we do very well. There are a number of ministries that happen from here um, that are helping feed people and helping like, encourage people, give them the, the material resources they need and to uh, to lift them up in, in Christ. Um, but it was noted in our, in our work together that uh, having a strategy for that, a plan, could help identify what are we missing, what can we do better, what, what fully are we trying to do in our work. Um, so we're gonna set up a task force that will do that work. We'll create a service plan, we'll pull on the talents, the interests of people who are doing that work, and, um, and create a kind of a master plan for service, if you will, and uh, see what might grow out of there. One of those things that I think would grow out of there naturally is a, a more a pattern of doing adult mission trips, um, leaving our community so we can go serve other people and then coming back and seeing how that might influence how we serve locally. That's always been one of the benefits for me when I go serve abroad, is that it opens my eyes to needs that are back at home. So as we continue to look for ways to be in ministry and mission here, also to, to go beyond Jackson, wherever that might be, and do work away from here as well. We're aware that um, it feels like there's a shortage of, of volunteers to do this good work. So we want to develop two things, really, not just numbers, but develop people who, who um, have skills and, and talents and, and um, patterns of inviting people into deeper faith relationships and not just meeting their material needs. So this is a, a strategy toward faith sharing as well as Feeding their, so to, in other words, to feed their souls as well as feed their bodies, if, like that metaphor. So, so we want to do some work to there and create a team that can help us with that as well. Um, I think that's what I want to say about that. So I think that covers all the strategies around this distribution of service. How many of you to pick the last one, the fifth of the five practices? And then we come to the fifth practice, extravagant generosity. Um, right now, um, we, um, we have only a finance committee who manages uh, the use of what comes in, but there isn't presently a stewardship team who pays attention to things like um, helping people develop a deeper commitment to generosity, the whole interpretation of its estate planning. One of the things that I um, noted a couple weeks ago in worship when people brought their worries forward, money was a big issue for numerous people. And so part of the work of the church is to help people understand how to manage their money so that they can become more generous. And so we will uh, um, uh, teach and preach and encourage people to practice the tithe and or proportional giving. The tithe is 10% of your income. Um, and oftentimes I encourage people to work toward that, start at 2% and then 
have a plan that you then move toward the full 10% as you grow in your generosity. Um, we'll be looking at ways that, again, part of the faith development includes how we use our resources. And so we'll look for uh, ways that we can deepen people's understanding of what the scripture says about money, of what the scripture says about giving of our time and talents, etc. We're going to uh, look at the possibility of offering Financial Peace University courses. That is a non-denominational um, uh, training process to help people get out of debt so that they can live more fruitfully and comfortably. Um, it's uh, founded by Dave Ramsey and um, many churches uh, around the world actually have taught those courses and got helped people get out of debt. Um, consumer debt is a big issue uh, everywhere, not just in Jackson. And so part of what we're looking at um, when it comes to extravagant generosity is not just asking people to give more, but to be a resource as a congregation to help them understand their relationship with money affects their relationship with God. And, um, and so we'll be doing some more teaching around that. Um, the next issue, that a key issue that we identify is lack of transparency of financials and budgeting. While the Finance Committee has some really solid uh, protocols in place, and I don't want you to look at this key issue and imagine that your money isn't safe with our people. That is not the case. But nobody knows what the protocol is. And um, what we haven't done well is communicate it to the congregation. And so we will be much more forthcoming. <coughs> we started this process with monthly reports uh, on our financial status in the newsletter. Um, we already conduct an annual audit that's required by our denomination to do that. But we haven't been reporting it to you. It's been all internal. So we'll do a much better job with reporting um, where we are as a congregation. I was surprised knowing pretty intimately what our financers are like in that congregation. In our congregational study, I heard over and over again that somehow this congregation doesn't have enough money to do anything. And the truth is that because of good people like you sitting right here and because of people like some of the saints who have gone before and who have um, provided for the church in their estate, we can do more. Um, and so we want to move away from that assumption that we're operating in a scarcity mode and look at the um, reality that, um, that this church has enough to do everything that God is calling us to do. One of the big pieces that we heard over and over again, not just from the congregation, but in our community study, is the use of the building. Um, there, this is a big building, <laughs> and there are lots of opportunities. There are also things that we need to do in order to outfit this building for 21st century ministry. This place was built a brick and mortar in the 19th century, and you know we do things a little differently these days, don't we? So we will identify an audit team to look at the building as a resource and identify where we need to get rid of clutter, where we need to freshen up, areas of the building that are not used at all or that are unutilized, technology that we need to invest in so that we can more, we had to borrow our uh, recording equipment today because our church doesn't own any kind of video recording equipment. Um, we are hampered in our sanctuary um, because we have no projection equipment. 
I'm pretty sure that those couple things will show up on a technology audit as we do the full audit of our resources. So um, there will be a task force developed to study very carefully the facilities. Um, uh, we, just as an anecdote, um, we did a walkthrough with our church coach when Brad Kalajanian was here. <clears throat> and we spent probably two hours going through every inch of this building. The only place he didn't go was up into the chimes loft, on the <laughs> up two ladders onto the fourth floor. Um, and one of his first responses was, wow, this place really has a lot of clutter. You probably need to hire a dumpster and um, toss a lot of the stuff that is going to get in the way of people feeling welcomed here. That's part of our hospitality ministry, after all, is as people come into this building, does it feel like somebody's old um, living room? Um, or um, my cluttered kitchen counter at, at my home? Or does it feel like a place where we're ready to welcome new people? And are there ministries that we might undertake in new ways if we had the technology in various places or the space was um, configured in such a way that we could actually do some new ministries? Okay, um, I want to just call your attention to the fact that these strategies have been an overview. Um, we have available for those of you who really like to dig into the details, there's a 33 page document that for every strategy you will find at least 10 or more very specific steps. We don't want you to imagine, as you're hearing this overview, that we haven't done our job. We have really thought about the details, but I'm not sure that um, you need to hear all of them or that you want to. I don't want to put you all to nap time uh, with all of the details. But for those of you who wish to have the details, we have 25 printed copies available for you to take with you today. It will also be posted on our web site, and so you can download those, and happy reading um, <laughs> as you look at um, a very ambitious plan. All of this, as Sarah said so beautifully, is not just change for the sake of change. It's change for the sake of the gospel. Our church simply must do a better job in intentionally making disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We can do it, and we must do it. I'm going to introduce Earl Pileski, also a lifetime member. Uh, lifetime, well, that's, uh, that's a long time, not quite as long as, as, uh, as Sarah. As Sarah. Uh, we moved here in 1973. I was a senior in high school. So uh, I was uh, a newbie. And uh, joined the uh, the Wesley Choir that was here, and have been in the choir I think most more or less ever since. But and then of course Candy and I were married here, and our kids uh, were uh, have grown up here and baptized here, as as you all have, as many of you have also experienced. And I've been involved in in the management, I guess you'd say, of the church. Uh, I've been, I was finance chair when I was 25, and uh, I was on the board of trustees and done a lot of different things here. And now I'm the uh, staff parish chair, which I had not done before. I managed to successfully avoid that for a little bit. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, when you talk about strategic planning, it's critical that any group or organization needs to know what it's attempting to accomplish. And when you have as many folks as we have here, and as many folks as we hope to have here, we have to have a plan for what we are going to do and how we're we going to conduct ourselves. And how do we guide our staff 
so that they know what we expect them to do. Uh, otherwise, folks uh, run around and, um, and, and do what they think they should be doing, but maybe not pulling all in the same direction. So we want to make sure we're all pulling in the same direction. Having a strategic plan such as we've uh, worked up here is part of that. And as staff parish chair, I want to make sure our staff know what we expect of them and that we provide them the tools that they need to conduct the ministries we expect to get done. And I think we've begun to do that in staff parish, making sure we have uh, adequate staffing. I'm glad to see Clayton here, for example. This was an important thing, uh, is to make sure that our technologies, that we are in, and I say over and over again, we are in the communication business here. We should be doing communication better than your grocery store and better than any other organization around. But sometimes we don't do it very well. But I think we're, going, we're beginning to do that and then having a strategic plan helps us to do that. Having a strategic plan helps us to allocate our resources. I'm an accountant, I'm all about kind of economics and allocating resources. We have, and one of our strengths of this church is, we have many resources. There are millions of resources that we have available to us that we have grown over the years and that people have given to us to conduct the ministries of this church. And uh, they gave it to us in the expectation that we would take some risks and be out there to conduct <laughs> ministries of this church. And so when we look to avail ourselves of those resources, um, it should be in furtherance of a plan that we've all embraced and that is part of a plan. Uh, we've done a little bit of that too. We have decided we're going to spend some money on something we need to have done, some ministry, and uh, we need to do more of that, I think, in the future to keep faith with those who provided those resources to us. To keep faith with those who provided those resources to us. So I look for, I really appreciate the strategic planning process that's, that's been gone through with, with the group. Um, let's all embrace that and move it all forward. We can do it. Thank you. In order to live into this plan, um, there are what we're calling enablers, kind of foundational pieces that need to be laid so that we can, as a congregation, move forward and accomplish these very ambitious strategies. Um, first of all, much of the work that we've done has been based on an assumption that we will do a better job as a congregation building partnerships and alliances. One of the things that we know, and that I'm guessing you know, is that no church can do everything. No church can fulfill all of the needs of all of the people in their community on their own. There are amazing agencies and um, other organizations in our community who are doing some really great things. And I'm guessing, I mean, as I look around, I know that many of you are involved in some of those. And so rather than reinventing the wheel in order to um, uh, accomplish the work that is ours to do, we're going to be much more intentional about finding out what's going on out there and giving our people an opportunity to partner with other organizations to make our uh, to make our church more effective. It's about streamlining. And if you look at the word streamlining, that's basically what these enablers are about. Um, we're pretty uh, um, heavy on organizational, I get meeting to death, I gotta tell you. I get zoomed to death at this point. Um, and so part of what we want to do is get people out of meetings and into ministry. Think um, uh, um, uh, getting people uh, into situations where some trusted through few representatives who have their um, thumb on the heartbeat of the congregation 
are able to make decisions quickly and effectively and then give people the authority and the resources that they need in order to get out there and do ministry. In order to accomplish that, we're looking at um, church structure issues. Um, we are currently structured in such a way that we're kind of siloed. Um, uh, trustees do their thing, finance does their thing, SPRC does their thing. Uh, we don't even have um, a mission outreach team at work right now. And so everybody's doing their own thing and they're doing well, but there's not any kind of cohesive effort. So we're going to look at a more um, streamlined and um, uh, um, uh, What's the word I'm trying to think of? Efficient. Efficient, thank you. Yeah, and we're going to be cooperating with one another and communicating a lot more. This will happen through the one board model, which I strongly urge you all to attend next Sunday. Our church coach and um, Gary Stepp, uh, as I shared earlier this morning before worship, are going to be leading a workshop about what is coming down the pike. Um, we're saying that if we want to accomplish everything that is in this 33-page uh, plan, that we're going to need to become more efficient, and we're going to need to become more flexible. We're going to need to be able to um, uh, evaluate ministries to see how effective they are, and to um, move quickly when we need to move quickly. So we'll be looking at in, um, understanding, and then eventually we'll come to a church vote um, around church governance. In order to change the governance of a church does require um, a church council vote. And so you're going to be hearing more about that. We're going to need the technology. We live in a technology age, and I know that Clayton would say amen to that. <laughs> um, we're going to need a plan um, as part of, uh, to enable all of the ministries of the church, we're going to need to develop a plan um, to um, use technology in the very best way possible to enable us to do ministry more effectively. And then church leadership we need to have plans of succession with each one of the teams, and we need to have training for folk so that they understand how to lead and how to move the ministry forward. And so we're going to be much more intentional from the nominations committee um, side on not just plugging um, round holes into round pegs, um, and uh, but actually looking at time and, talent, time and talent, people's gifts and skills and passions, and try to do a better match of um, people with their placement. And we also just want to make sure that we're not using people. Uh, um, part of the issue that we're facing now as an aging congregation is that folk get tired. And, um, and so we want to make sure that we can release them from some of the things that wear us out to free us up for those things that give us joy. That's what those enablers are all about, to enable us to become more effective and efficient and collaborative. That's the other word I was trying to think of in our ministries. And now I'm going to turn this over again to Candy, who's going to bring it home. Thanks, Betty. So, now we're on uh, slide 24, if you're flipping through there. Oh, thank you. Is that better? Good, thanks. So, we are at January, and uh, we are where we are communicating out about the various activities that are coming up. And Tom has already mentioned about the time and talent survey. Looks like this. We've got several up here. If you've not filled one out, please do it. This is one of the ways that we are going to um, fill the various task forces. We'd like to get people on committees or on teams, some of them very short term, some of them a little bit longer term, where it, it's a good match for them. So um, make sure that you fill that out. We can Greg needs those back by the 30th. 
Also coming up in February, there will be some listening sessions. So you all are seeing the first look at these strategies, and we'd like to get your feedback. I know that there'll be a little time today that we can talk about it. If you're like me, I have to go away, think about it, then I've got lots to say. So, um, so we're going to uh, provide some time to get together and have those chats. So keep watching for the dates. We're working on those now. The task forces will begin to be stood up, and we will also begin the governance assess practice. It's actually we're going to be doing some modeling some on that, on that governance practice and um, figuring out the best way that, to implement that here. Having um, the, our coach come in, Brad Telgen and um, Gary Stepp next week will be uh, a good opportunity for everybody to learn more about that. And so here's, okay, you all got this in your bulletin today. So make sure to tune into that. If you can't come in, it will be broadcast as <coughs> Mike, you did not get this today? This no, 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 oh, okay. The choir doesn't get them. Oh, the choir didn't get it. Okay, I'm sorry. So we've got, we've got a few extras. You can take those with you. Okay, and in May, there'll be, the task forces will be making their plans and um, uh, starting to make their plans, I should say, and the enablers should be also established. So things are continuing to move along, and uh, we're going to continue to make progress. This, so this is the snapshot for what's coming up in the next six months. Remember I said this is just a three-year plan, so we'll be doing more planning again, not too far away. Here is a recap, and I'm going to go right to the strategy box. Um, so we've talked about uh, what the strategy is, and now it's time to start putting together some. When you look at that deal, detail plan, you'll see that there are, there's, there, it's not, oh, you know, it, there's a reason it's called detail. Uh, it, does, it does identify a lot of opportunities for how we can implement these strategies. And that is intended to help the task forces as they come together, they don't have to start with a blank piece of paper. There are some ideas that they can use. It doesn't mean that they have to use them all. It doesn't mean that all the details there, because it certainly isn't. Um, but it does, it gives them a starting point. And that's, that's what the, our task force was hoping to do. Um, when, when the teams come together, they'll be putting their timelines together. They'll be figuring out what it is that they want to do. And that will go to Leadership Council to make sure that the resources and the um, both financial and people are there and that it uh, meets their expectations around what it is they want these task forces to deliver. Uh, also, they'll be putting together some measures, some metric measures. I'm real big on knowing what does success look like. And so a lot of times that means figuring out what success is before you get to the end of it, otherwise you may not know that you're there. So um, the task forces will be looking at what does success look like and, and how do they measure that. Again, something that leadership council will want to, to know about and the rest of the congregation will like to know about too. So these are all about living into our, our vision, the vision that we have put together back in 2019. Here's, here's how you can, you can help. You need to get involved. You get that time and talent survey completed, and then a share with the congregation, with your friends, about these town halls. This is a great way to learn about them. They're going to, they're going to be available on Zoom. We're going to do three of them live. Uh, there's a list. There's, there's a list. Oh, yeah, it's coming up in this packet. Thank you. Um, on what those are. There is also that, that um, meeting with Brad coming up. Make sure to uh, come to the feedback sessions and um, get engaged when it comes to rolling out. Don't be afraid to give us your feedback because we want to hear it. Um, here are the dates for the town halls. There's three of them that are, are live. One of uh, another one this afternoon out of this stuff will be doing one Wednesday night during what a Wednesday. Then there are three that are listed that we'll be doing via Zoom. And, the last thing, and here's the information about the the, um, 
the one board model, this is where you'll be able to get some more information about that and how that would work here. Know that there will be lunch provided, but you're going to need to have a reservation so that um, the kitchen staff can prepare for that. Uh, that will also be recorded. It will be conducted up in the sanctuary, and it will be live streamed. So we're trying to get the word out to as many places as possible. Last up, we have Phil Bickle, and he's going to give us the testimony. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you again. Sarah and Earl have said so much that there's not too much I can add, but well, let me try a little bit. My history with this church is in the 1970s, Susan and I were looking around for a home church. We came here and our search stopped. This was where we wanted to be. Wonderful people, wonderful Christians, a great minister, uh, Dr. Boyles, just captured our attention right away. And we've had a series of great pastors, great ministers ever since. Um, and I had the feeling with this church that this is a place that had always been here and would always be here. I tend to share Sarah's concerns now. We have had dwindling membership, and there are some problems that we have to deal with. But with this strategic plan, I think we have the ability to not only survive, but actually thrive in the future and do well. Uh, my current role in the church, aside from being a member and a choir member and all that, I chair the uh, trustees, and there are a number of trustees here today. We have a great group of trustees. In the past, I've chaired the finance committee, I've chaired stewardship, and some other committees. I never had the uh, pleasure of being on the same committee with Earl. I'm not sure how we've missed. <laughs> We're always on different committees at the same time. We'll just sit next to each other. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. But I do have a background in strategic planning. I spent eight years as the uh, director of corporate planning and consumers across the street. We used to be across the street, it's down the road now. But um, a big part of my job was the development, implementation, communication, ongoing updating of the strategic plan. And from my background, I'll tell you that what uh, this group has put together, what Andy put together, is an excellent strategic plan. It provides us with the basis of what we need to move forward. But so far, to this date, plan has been a noun. It is a document that's been put together. Henceforth, plan must be averted. This is where we move into action. Yeah. And if you don't remember anything else from what people have said today, you will you'll remember a lot more. But if you just look at page eight of the handout, that tells where we are, who we are, what we want to be, our vision, our mission, guiding principles. If you look at page eight at the strategic plan and the plans, these are the action plans. This is how we move from where we are now to where we want to be. And it really does involve a lot of people in order to be successful. I mean, we can't just say, great job, uh, can do with that plan, good luck with the implementing. That's not, that's not how it's going to work. But I think if everybody here, me, Audie, everybody, if we all look at the uh, strategies, the areas of strategies, and kind of figure out which ones do I want to be involved with, which ones interest me involved with, get that information back again the end of the uh, strategic planning team, that will be a tremendous help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's all I have to say because I, I guess. I do want to leave you with the idea that I really do think that this document that they put together gives us everything we need to move forward with actions that will help us thrive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so, I know we've run over a little bit, and I'm really sorry about that. I told you that we have a few, a few minutes for questions and discussion. So let's do five minutes for burning questions, any discussion that you want. I'll be around for a little while before I have to run out to this stuff. I will be around a lot more. We will have some listening sessions after church services during February is what we're, we're looking to do. 
So you can conduct a series in one of the side rooms. So we'll work out the details. So now it's your turn. Do you have any questions? Anything that you'd like to know more about or thoughts, feedback? Thank you. Yes. It has been a lot of work, but I, it's nice seeing it come together. And um, it's very exciting to see what the future holds. But we're only halfway there. <laughs> we're not, yeah, we basically haven't really started. We've done the research and we've got the background. Now we've got to put the boots on the ground. Now we ramp up. Yeah. yeah. Well, Linda's right. Uh, uh, a lot of companies, churches, even this church, have done strategic plans similar to this. And the implementation, planning is great, but you got to implement. Otherwise, it just collects the dust on the shelf. And we don't want that to happen. More papers into the recycling bin. Yeah. <laughs> so people need, people need to get involved. It was a small committee that pulled this together. We gathered a lot of information from a lot of places. But now, to make it happen, takes more effort, more resources, more people power. Thank you, Melinda. Anything else? No. Yes. As a, as a relative newcomer, that this is all you know, very exciting stuff. Um, you know, I, I've only been here for a little while now, but just you know, all this new stuff aside, I thought this has been a very welcoming place. I mean, more so than a lot of other places I've experienced. And I think we have a great foundation to launch off of going into all these new endeavors. So I think it's it's not pie in the sky. I think it's attainable. And as you know, the younger generation, it's all stuff that I think is, you know, we're heading in the right direction. We're looking for the, the right path. Thank you. That's good. Thank you, Brian. That's, that's good to see you. Yeah. Sure. I, would, I, would, I would add maybe something I, I don't know that I said well enough when I was speaking, but um, a lot of times you kind of focus on, well, gee, we'd rather be doing this or we don't have enough of that. But we have a lot of assets. We have a lot of great people. We have, um, we have this building. We have other resources. We have many of the tools that we will need. And so uh, we have advantages that many churches do not have. And uh, while we are, while we do have some of the difficulties that many churches are dealing with, we have the capabilities of addressing them. So uh, that's a cause for celebration, I think. Absolutely. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, we do have, we do have what it takes. A lot of churches don't have the assets, the money, the, the, the building to, to make things happen. So. Okay, just another minute or two. Anything else, Bill? Just to piggyback a little bit on what Earl said, um, being in education for a long time, dealing with facilities, if you're looking for partnerships with communities, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are agencies out there. There are, um, I, I just wrote, I wrote down child care and preschool. Across every one of those goals that we've got here, the strategies. And, and we got, we, God didn't focus on one day necessarily, there's seven days out of the week. And with through that vehicle, whether it's somebody comes into this facility, somebody meets the people that are here, that is your connection. And that you start with young people. Young people are bringing in. You know, their parents. Mm -hmm. Their yes. parents aren't 70 years old. Yeah. Um, I'm just throwing that out there yeah. because if you if you need to have some kind of a resource and a vehicle to re regenerate the youth of this church, that's mm -hmm. the beginning. Mm -hmm. And there is a great need for yeah. child care yes. and preschool. Yeah, that's absolutely right. That's one of the things when we did the community study, we found that there is a huge <laughs> Huge need for child care for like elementary students all the way up to high school. And um, we have a great opportunity because we've got a lot of space um, there. And many of you may not know, 
I didn't know, many years ago, before I had kids, there used to be a preschool here. So we can do stuff like that again, or as Phil said, partner with other groups who maybe need a facility, they know how to do it. Um, and I want to mention that we had Wendy Wright. Wright. White. Wendy White. White. White has been in the church um, doing kids' explosion. And that's a one day a week thing that happens after school. Well, we can do more of that. We can partner with other people and provide them the space. So, yeah. Well, we've got to look at the facility we talked about. I was on the, on the board yeah. meeting, the first one. And you've got, you've got to <clears throat> restore a lot of what we've got here and also keep in mind. If you're going to go with technology, you're going to have to look at um, retrofittings right. of some yeah. sort. Yeah, there's, to bring in, to, we have to be prepared to, right. to do some of these things. The, the facility will, may need some updating. There are, there are safety requirements, fire requirements that you know, maybe we don't have at this time. So we'll have to look at that. But we can do that. So thank you. All right, so we're out of time. Thank you for staying today. I really appreciate hearing from you. And um, don't be afraid to uh, to speak up. You know where to find me. So thank you. I'm sure you love here today. Thank you. Thank you.